Is it possible to end a relationship with someone whose trauma is dragging down your whole life without triggering more trauma for them? If you grew up with abuse and neglect, chances are you've had relationships with other traumatized people. And while sometimes this combination can be stable and loving and work well, relationships between two traumatized people can sometimes last a lot longer than they should. They might have begun, the, the relationship might have started with the kind of you know, rush right in mentality that's so common among people with attachment wounds, and that's CPTSD people. And they might be reluctant to leave the relationship no matter how bad it is because their, their tendency to go into abandonment depression every time a relationship ends feels so horrible, it's like not even worth it. It feels easier to just stay in the unhappy relationship and suffer through it and hope that by some miracle, everything gets better. So if you get the courage to actually end a relationship with someone who is emotionally fragile, they may have kind of put in your mind a threat implied or sometimes spoken to your face that they're not going to be okay, that they're going to hurt themselves, that you're responsible to keep them functioning by never leaving them. So my letter today is from a woman I'll call Tricia and she writes, Dear Anna, I need your fairy pencil and your tough love. I got it, Tricia. <laughs> I'm going to read through the letter just once here, um, all the way through, and I'll be circling things that I want to come back to. I'll come back a second time, and then I think I can help you, Tricia. Okay. My question, which I haven't been able to find an answer anywhere else online, is what is the best way to break up with someone who has CPTSD so you don't add to their trauma? I've been with my boyfriend for four years. We've lived together for two years, and I care deeply for him. I want to do as little harm as possible to both of us as we separate our lives. To be fair, I suspect he has CPTSD due to child abuse that he, his parents, and his siblings have shared with me, and his behavior fits all the symptoms, but he's not been formally diagnosed. However, after we moved in together, he was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder by a therapist, which was also confirmed by a psychiatrist. Before I met him, he was also diagnosed with and had some limited treatment for PTSD after he found his wife of 20 plus years dead on their bed due to a previously unknown pulmonary embolism. Yikes. The matter is complicated by my own struggles. As an adoptee, I've struggled with long, lifelong abandonment issues of my own and was raised by a mostly absent father and an emotionally erratic, hyper-controlling narcissist mother. My job as a kid was to meet her needs and make her look good. My brother and I, both in our 50s, are currently in therapy after the surfacing of our unhealed childhood trauma last year as we cleaned out and sold our childhood home. I'm a rape survivor when I was a teenager and have been divorced twice. The last marriage was for 20 years to a serial cheater who was emotionally and financially abusive. I've been diagnosed with PTSD and had a lot of therapy over many years, including EMDR. I don't think I've ever had a healthy, intimate relationship. I'm a people pleaser and good at crap fitting, magical thinking, future faking, and gaslighting myself. In the beginning of my current relationship, we were both very distrusting of each other and thought we were going slow by dating for several years. However, in looking back, I now see that we emotionally bonded very quickly. During the first year of dating, we each tried to break up with the other at least once, primarily due to the inability to resolve conflict about the differences in how we wanted to live our lives. The pain, grief, anger, and panic of abandonment always brought us back together. There it is. The longest we stayed broken up was three days. We got back together with the understanding we would start therapy. I believe we are trauma bonded. And even though we could see the early red flags, we didn't have the tools or strength to separate. We, trauma bonded is um, it's another word for um, intermittent reinforcement. It's a psychological condition people can get when love is um, given and taken away and given and taken away. And uh, you know, even a psychologically healthy person is vulnerable to getting hooked into a love that only gets switched on once in a while. All right. We've been in therapy, both couples and individually, for over two years. 
When COVID happened, we had made great improvements in therapy and decided to move in together at the urging of our teenage children who liked each other and wanted more of an intact family situation. He sold his house and moved into my house. Then he lost his job and his emotionally abusive, tyrannical behavior and terrifying dissociations emerged and became the norm. This prompted the BPD diagnosis, uh, borderline personality, and a year of trying different medications, reading about BPD, and increased therapy, which he has really dedicated himself to and made great strides. Although he still has episodes, we all do a much better job managing around them as well. He has since started working again. During this time, I've tried to focus on my healing instead of my normal codependent, ego-driven focus on fixing the other person and have had a lot of practice setting and keeping my boundaries. Okay, good. I just wanted to interject um, for anybody who is not familiar with borderline personality disorder. It's connected often to people who had trauma as children. It's not exactly the same as complex PTSD, which is what we talk about here. Um, there are some symptoms in common. There could be emotional dysregulation, which can be pretty extreme with borderline personality disorder. There's also um, really unstable relationships and um, a tendency to sort of get totally idealize another person and then totally devalue them alternatingly. What Trish is describing here sounds like why the psychiatrist and therapist diagnosed that. Um, the other thing it has is a, a propensity in many people to do really dangerous, risky behavior, um, including you know attempts to commit suicide, which is just dreadful for a family or for a partnership um, when there's that fear there all the time. So, okay, Tricia says, I now feel emotionally separate enough to see we are truly incompatible with our core needs. A few examples include that I'm a goer. I like to do things professionally, personally, socially. He's a stayer. He likes to stay at home and wants me there with him most of the time. He complains about the power difference between us, which I'm not sure what that means to him exactly because he can't explain it, but I like the, in the independence I feel now and I don't want to lose it again. He wants more of a commitment, marriage, engagement to feel secure in the relationship. And I want to feel more secure that the relationship is healthy and I'm really not interested in getting married. Living together in an exclusive relationship is commitment enough for me. He's really a good man and has a lot of great attractive qualities, but I feel restrained and restricted in this relationship. I don't feel like I can live my best life and also meet what he wants. And when we're together, one of us is always accommodating the other at the expense of what we want. It's exhausting and ultimately unsustainable. Is this truth or is this me being avoidant because of my trust issues? So I'm at the point where I want to live my life separate from him and have shared these things with him. He does not want the relationship to end and is doing everything he can to convince me to stay. I think he is crap fitting what he wants and needs to me instead of acknowledging and honoring his own wants and needs. There are women who would be very happy staying home and married to a loyal, in charge kind of man, right? Also, we both know that awful pain that comes from breaking up and are dreading it. How can you break up a trauma bond? Is there any way to reduce the abandonment melange? Our therapist has been trying to help us slowly, amicably separate, but he is not cooperating. His position is that he doesn't want it, so why should he help that make it happen? I read somewhere that no contact after breakup is best, a rip the bandaid off kind of approach. That feels very harsh. For someone who already struggles with insecurity and abandonment, won't that just add to their trauma and mine? Plus, given the time it will take to untangle our lives, that's not possible. Not having a solid plan is adding to the doubts I already have about breaking up, even though I know if I don't, I'll always feel like I settled. I also know I will regret breaking up and miss all the great things about being together. Any input about the best way to break up with someone that has CPTSD by someone who also likely has CPTSD? Your thoughts would be greatly appreciated. Trisha. Okay, Trisha. Yes, I think I can help. I'm going to go through and just read back some of the things you said and see if we can shed some insight on this. Okay. Together for four years, lived together for two, felt like you had gone slowly, but there was an intense emotional bond. So, okay. Sounds like it was progress for you. You have a history of harsh relationships, so at least you did take your time before moving in. Good job. You're trying to set boundaries now. Good job. Yes, you're with somebody who basically anything that, that changes about this relationship is going to be terrible and not your fault. All right, so we're going to talk you through how to deal with that. 
You suspect he has CPTSD? Maybe. Um, he was diagnosed with borderline. So something about that, I'm, I can't diagnose anybody, and even if I could, I couldn't do it online, right? But um, a lot of therapists and psychiatrists who are trauma savvy believe that some borderline personality diagnoses are actually CPTSD, complex PTSD, because there is that overlap of symptoms. Um, but they are distinct things. The thing about borderline is it, it, it can be very difficult to treat. CPTSD is difficult to treat if you don't have the right tools, but we can use regulation tools to start changing the brain injury that has set our symptoms in motion, in particular dysregulation. Now, I think no matter how somebody was diagnosed, they could benefit from learning to re-regulate. But I'm not here to give advice to this person who did not write to me, this partner of yours. I'm here to talk to you about how you can detach. Um, I, you know, good sleuthing work that you figured out what this might be, and I hear that you helped him. Um, you were raised by an absent father and an erratic, hyper-controlling narcissist mother. There's your pattern. There it is. And you're, you, you want to try to like not get magnetized back into that pattern of either being like your father and avoiding, you know, just being avoidant, um, or like your mom with being very controlling and selfish. And when you say you've had codependent relationships, I would just say codependent, codependence is a more um, socially acceptable form of also being very controlling and self-centered, right? trying to make other people fix them, fix them so they will be how you think they should be rather than just like letting them be themselves and autonomous and sovereign over their own lives and deciding whether you want them in your life, right? So that's my take on that, that you're kind of in a milder version of your mom right now. And so that's okay. You have a lot of self-awareness. You're doing everything about it. But I can just see, this is what I think. I think that you're at high risk to not be able to get out of this relationship if you don't prepare adequately because yeah, you're being kind of emotionally blackmailed that he's not going to be okay. You don't think you've ever had a healthy, intimate relationship. You're a people pleaser, good at crap fitting, magical thinking, future faking, and gaslighting yourself. And that's how you've stayed in this relationship so long. I seldom have heard anybody so clear in such a calm, clear way that they don't want to be in the relationship anymore. And um, I, I can hear a little part of you trying to build him up. And there was that sort of relapse at the end of your letter where you're like, I'll know that I'll regret it. You will regret it for, a, you know, it will, the regret will come in waves just because you have CPTSD, you have abandonment wounds, and that's what it does. It projects a false story that, oh my gosh, you're going to die without this person. But actually you're in the middle of a living death with somebody with this intense drama going on all the time. Somebody getting completely upset that you leave the house and have a life and wants you there all the time. And yeah, I, I, it's very clear from your letter. Yeah, it's not working. I think it's really positive that you're thinking of leaving and it's caring of you to think about like, how can you um, do this with kindness? And you can be kind all you want, but here's the thing about a person with borderline. And I, I, I had a relationship with somebody who I believe was borderline, not formally, formally diagnosed, but had all the symptoms and who did end up dying by his own hand. Um, and I felt blackmailed in that I wanted to leave. And there were threats, like, if you do, I'm going to do this. And well, it ended up happening anyway, but I know that I wasn't responsible. I know that I had to look out for my own, you know, um, mental health, security, my children, everything. And I had to put up a boundary in my life so that he could not get back into it. And then he did what he did. And it was devastating to me. It was terrible. I never would wish that on anyone. <clears throat> but the solution, the prevention for that was not to stay and let this person, he had very serious problems, to let him stay in my life. That was not the solution. So, you know, we all try to be as kind as we can. I think you're doing a great job of like thinking of that in advance so that you don't have to have a big yelling match. You don't have to have it be a big dramatic, you know, get out, you're locked out. Those are the types of things that really set off a person with abandonment wounds. As I understand it, people with borderline personality disorder, there's almost always an abandonment wound and it just, it, it cut very deep. It's very hard for them to manage when it kicks up. And um, the intensity of the depression that hits for a few hours at a time is like something most people can't imagine is what I'm told. And then it goes away. There's the idealization. There's the total tyranny. You're, des you're describing it. So you guys have done 
therapy, you've done everything right. You did EMDR, the medication, and some things got better, but then he lost his job and this horrible side of him came out. And um, he has started working again, but you saw these terrifying dissociations and it got normal. He was emotionally abusive. So right there, you know, Trisha, I just want to say, if somebody has something going on, like everybody, everybody can work on their healing. Everybody has the potential to get better. But in a relationship, you know, this is not a marriage. And, you know, of course, I can imagine why he wants it to be a marriage because he knows. He knows his behavior is over the line. You know, it, it's coming. I know he knows it's coming. I, I think he's bargaining with the end. And so are you just because you're going to feel that abandonment melange too. We'll talk about that in a moment. So that's all really normal. It's really normal for people who had trauma to struggle with that, to feel like they can't face the feelings that are come up, come up around endings. But the ending is like, it's right there. You know, it's like that is where you are. It doesn't do anybody any favors to stick around and pretend that your presence is going to make everybody happy somehow. Taking you down and ruining your life is not the solution to his struggles. So um, everybody's doing the best they can. I hear that. He's working again. It's likely to get a little better. But for you, you know, this thing where you get codependent and you call it codependent, ego-driven, focus on fixing. You have a lot of practice now setting boundaries. This is great because, I don't know, I, I've been doing videos about this in the past few months. People talk about codependence like it's some sort of like lesser problem, but I see codependence as something just as bad as like a major addiction or a personality disorder. It can be that bad. Sure, you can have a mild form of it or little episodes of it, or it just shows up with certain people. If you have this little imprint in you to be codependent and you are with somebody who's doing this saying, I'll die if you don't stay with me, your codependence will be activated all the time. And you know what it does to you? You know what the price you pay? It's not just that you enable somebody or you stay stuck in a bad relationship. It shuts down your living, breathing spirit. It just shuts you down. It's you in an addiction, you checking out of reality, you not having a self. It's devastating to your development as a person. It serves no one for you with all your potential to contribute to the world you know, to just shut it all down and just hemorrhage it for a, a, you know, a person who really like as much as they believe that your love will fix them, it won't. That's not what's going to fix them. And what fixes them or what helps them is going to be their journey. It's their journey. So you can get all your energy back and that's wonderful. And in time, that will be better for him. It, it's no fun. You know, it's no fun having a sword hanging over your head where you know it's about to end. And yeah, he's going to take it badly. He's probably going to make threats. He may actually hurt himself. And so this is, you have a therapist. I really encourage you to stay very connected with your therapist. And this isn't the same as like leaving um, a battering relationship, but I think you might want to follow the same imprint where very quietly you set up your exit and you are ready to go and you gradually bring enough stuff over there that you can get out. And I hear you that you can't, you know, you're, you're going to need time to sort of separate all your stuff. But there's a way to do that in a relationship where there's a sick dynamic that's likely to take you down. And so just as somebody leaving a relationship with a partner, um, they might get violent with them. And then, you know, the whole cycle would start again. The cycle that you're in can be just as devastating to a person's life as physical violence. All right. So I really encourage you to have like, you know, emotional bodyguards to help you with this transition, to help you stave off the abandonment melange that, that will make you go, what am I doing? This is terrible. I can't possibly live without this terrible relationship. I must go back and look how he feels and I've got to save him. You know, it's going to come, right? That's the little groove that you had stamped in your soul. You're going to deactivate it. Your healing efforts just keep deactivating it, but it's always there sort of like a chicken pox virus comes up and gives you shingles later in life, right? It's always there. It's just, it just goes dormant sometimes. It's going to come up for you. It's just going to come up. And when you know that and it's coming up, you're going to be able to have a little distance from that idea of like, oh, what have I done? Three days have passed. I must go back. You just have a little distance. You'll be like, everybody hold my hands. I feel like I have to go back, but I know I don't want to. And then his drama will definitely be coming at you. And I think that you're going to want a way to have a boundary against that. That's my opinion. I know that 
you know, he's someone you have loved and you care about him and you, you respect him and you don't want to treat him badly. But, he, you know, I just want you to think this through. If he's going to try to manipulate you by any means necessary to get you to not act in your own best interest, what are you going to do? What is going to be your plan for when he begins that? Um, can you have a communication boundary where he can't reach you? Or maybe, um, and sometimes when I coach people on how to leave a relationship, um, you know, it's, it's, it varies depending on if there's abuse in the relationship or something threatening about the leaving, that changes it. But even in a relationship that was perfectly fine, it's just that someone is no longer into it. With leaving, I do suggest a rip off the Band-Aid. And then you can make an appointment to talk maybe in a therapist's office a week later. You announce it, you leave the premises, you have what you need, or maybe while you know he's out, you have your stuff, you wait for him to come home, you, know, you move your stuff out that you absolutely need, you wait for him to come home, you tell him what's going on, and then you make your exit. And you try to avoid him knowing where you are so he can't come after you. And uh, I don't know about your guy, but that's a lot. What, that's the sort of thing that can happen with somebody with borderline. They're so desperate not for it to end. It feels like death. They'll do anything to fight it. Of course, it's not death. That's not what it is. It's, it's just the end of a relationship. So when we say abandonment melange, it's um, a word that Pete Walker uses to say this, this horrible combination of very intense grief, very intense anger, very intense fear that comes up for people who had been abandoned as kids. And it can feel like life-threatening in, in adulthood. Even not just getting left, but deciding to leave someone else kicks it in. I totally hear you about that. I still have it. Now that I know that that's what it is, though, sometimes when it kicks in, I just go, oh, there it is again. And sometimes I'll just notice, oh, I'm having this like sick feeling about something. But basically, I just sort of had a, you know, I had a thought. I could have an abandoning thought if I'm angry at my husband or something. And then I'll have this sick feeling that's so familiar to me. And I'll go, oh, I just gave myself abandonment melange. And then I take care of that, what it is. I talk to myself about it. I use my techniques. I get the fear and resentment out. I make sure, you know, I'm good with him. I'm not putting any threat on him. I'm definitely here for, for life with him. And um, so I can do that. But of all the bad relationships I've had. My, the only thing I wish I had changed is that I had gotten out earlier. Sometimes that I had seen the red flags or observed them, honored them, and didn't get in in the first place. But when I had needed to leave a relationship, I knew it so much longer than when I did. And so, you know, I just really, like, send you my love and support to make your exit and focus on caring for yourself and your boundaries. I can tell you're kind. I can tell you're nice. There's no way to stop the borderline symptoms from kicking in. So he has a therapist. He has people he can go to for support for that. And it sounds like time to very privately plan your exit. And then once you've done it, you've done it as nicely as you can, um, I'd like you to visualize and plan and then use a way of holding the boundary. It's no longer negotiable. There's really nothing more to talk about. It seems harsh to you just because culturally a lot of people do that. They do a, a gradual separation. But they're not dealing with somebody with borderline. They're not dealing with great threats of self-harm or begging and crying or quitting jobs. You're in a different ball game. You have very, very good reasons for setting a boundary on this relationship. And I just, I hope you have the courage to do it. You have professionals who know how to help you with this. And I would also really encourage you to... Um, Check out 12-step recovery. I've been saying this a lot. Not everybody has money for constant therapy, you know, at the level they would like and need. We all, whether you have therapy or not, we all need support from peers who are going through it too. We need a place to go on Saturday night at the end of a relationship where, you know, we used to have a companion to sit and watch a favorite show and now we're alone. That's the kind of thing that can drive you back into the arms of a bad relationship. So when you have a group of friends and you do have somewhere to go, it can be so much more positive and sustainable for you to make leaving a relationship a step up in your life rather than, you know, a floodgate opening into disaster. It doesn't ever have to be that again. All right. I know you know, I know you know that. I know you know this is the right thing to do. This thing where the therapist has tried, you know, nobly to help you probably in your own goal to slowly and amicably separate 
But I think that even people who don't have trauma have trouble with slow, amicable separation. And that only happens when people have no attachment anymore and no attraction. Like breaking up is hard to do. That's why there's so many songs about it. It's hard. So I go with the rip off the Band-Aid and have boundaries approach. And will it add to his trauma? No, it's not going to add to his trauma. Everything, when he doesn't get what he wants attachment-wise, is going to activate old wounds. But you are not inflicting trauma on somebody by deciding that the relationship is over. That's not a trauma. It's, it's technically not an abandonment either. You know, he's not a child. He has a means to take care of himself. He's able to work. It's a very different thing. When we talk about abandonment wounds, we're talking about actually being emotionally or physically abandoned as a child, being a memory in our consciousness that then plays out like a movie in front of us. But it's not fair to say that people who break up with us have abandoned us. They've actually done a very legitimate thing of deciding, no, this is not the relationship for me. That's a logical and healthy step. It's not a crime to do that. And yes, there are exceptions, but in your case, I just it's not abandonment. It's a, it's a healthy decision. And what's good for you is good for all. So you don't have a solid plan yet. You know you're going to miss him, and you will get support, get your friends. 12-step um, fellowship like maybe um, Al-Anon, ACA, which is Adult Children of Alcoholics and Other Dysfunctional Families, um, CODA, or Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous. Get the strongest sponsor you can and work the steps with her. Get real about this. Don't let codependents rob you of another year of your life. All right? So if you are listening to this and you want to know more about abandonment melange, I've got a video lined up for you. Hear about it, and I will see you very soon.